Hi everyone, I'm Jerry Schumann, pastor here at Ludlow Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this video blesses and encourages you in your faith. And please consider sharing this on social media. Doing so is a strategic way that we're able to share the gospel with other people today. But before we begin, please keep this in mind. This video is not intended to be, and really it cannot be, a replacement for your commitment to a local church. God commands his people to gather regularly for worship and for fellowship under the leadership and the care of godly elders where the whole body is knit together and that's how the body grows and builds itself up in love. So nothing online can be a replacement for that. So if you're in the area, uh, come and join us for worship. We'd love to have you with us. If you're not nearby, please be sure that you are committed to a local, faithful, Bible-believing church. Thank you, and God bless. All right, let's open up with prayer. <clears throat> Lord God, thank you so much for your words. Thank you so much for these people. God, I pray that forever uh, all of these people Despite any of the circumstances they may find themselves in, the difficulties of life, life is rarely easy. Despite any despair that's in front of them, Lord, that they would remember that, that the joy of the Lord is their strength. That they would find joy in, in, in all of their circumstances, Lord. And I pray that uh, these words from your scripture will help to remind them of that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Glad to be back once again. <clears throat> so Jerry offered me the chance to come and bring the word of God to you one more time. And I thought long and hard about what a good parting shot might be. Here's a little secret. Every other time that I've preach a sermon here, it's actually been a recycled sermon from something I had already written. And so the Hewitts have heard pretty much all of my sermons at least once before, so they can tell you if I've improved my delivery. I would just rewrite it a little bit so it was more relevant to this congregation, but it was basically the same stuff, and they would always remember. I remember Tim would always kind of smile at me because he's heard it before. I think I improved, but you can ask him. <laughs> But this time I wanted to put a little more effort into it, and so I wanted to leave you with something that I felt was relevant, directly relevant to this time in 2023, and hopefully for all time. So here is what I came up with. Have you guys heard of the various pills that people talk about? That's right, pills. Not the kind you see advertised on TV. I'm talking about like the red pill, the blue pill. Have you heard of this? The black pill, the white pill. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you're not, but this is what all the kids are talking about these days. They're talking about the pill. It's not an actual pill, it's a metaphor. I think it comes from the movie The Matrix, which if you've seen it, the main character is presented with two pills. There's a red pill and a blue pill. And he's told that if he takes the red pill, that he's going to learn the true nature of everything. And he may or may not like it, but at least he'll know the truth. And even if he doesn't like it, though, he can't go back. So he's got to think very carefully about taking this red pill. If he takes the blue one, he can go along his merry way. He'll never know the truth, but, you know, at least he'll be happy and safe and all that kind of thing. He, he takes the red pill. And he doesn't like what he discovered. <laughs> but of course, you know, red, blue, natural, you got to politicize this stuff. And so that's what people have done. The red pill these days, when people talk about it, it's, it's about something that makes you feel more Republican. Like, it's like, it'd be something like, you know, did you see Tucker Carlson last night? Man. Red pill moment. And it's the same with the blue pill. It's something that just works in reverse. It makes you feel more Democrat. Usually, though, the red pill is, is spoken of very positively. The blue pill is more negative. Nobody wants to take blue pills. That's, that's the idea. Well, the white and black pill, they're similar, but they're a lot more general. So white pills would be things that, that, that they give you hope, right? They give you hope in the future. It makes you feel confident in the future. So someone might say something like this. You know, man, the last few weeks, they've been really rough. I've lost my job. I got the final notice on the rent. My car got repoed. But guys, 
my baby son just smiled at me and said, Dad, for the first time, totally white-pilled. Black pills are the opposite, though. They're the things that make you feel despair. They make you feel negative about the future. They make you give up caring or stop trying. Black pills are the kinds of things that happen when you say, well, nothing I can do about it. It is what it is. That's life. Black pills crush your courage. They're their soul, they eat away at your soul. Black pills are Satan's favorite kind of pills because they lead to like an inaction, just like a depression almost, where you don't even want to get out of bed because you're so black-pilled. Black pills are freely available at our time. They're everywhere. Black pills are handed out like candy in 2023. I'm sure you can think of things that would kind of make you feel black-pilled. All right, so we're not going to talk about pharmaceuticals the rest of this time. I have only one point for today's sermon, and that point is this. The faithful Christian must relentlessly refuse to take black pills. That's the bottom line. You simply must refuse to be driven into a permanent state of despair. There are no black pills allowed. So I'm going to read our passage today in just a minute. If you want to follow along, it's going to be from Nehemiah chapter 8, starting right at the beginning. So if you want to turn there, I'm going to set the stage a little bit first while you do that. So the book of Nehemiah, you, you may not know, it's kind of like a companion book to the book of Ezra, which I named my second son after. So you know I like these books. These books are both about the same period of time, and they contain a lot of the same events but they're from two different perspectives. And I kind of like that because it kind of allows you to see it from Ezra, who's a priest, his perspective, and then Nehemiah, who's a layman. A lot of the same events are talked about. It's about the rebuild of Israel. So they reconstruct the temple. They reconstruct the city. And I think I like, that's, that's why I like these books because when I look around the nation, it certainly seems to me like we are going to eventually enter a period of rebuild. So God, you know, the, the, whole, the whole stage is set. God has allowed his people to be destroyed and taken captive by the Babylonians who were part of the great Persian Empire. And he allowed this because Israel rejected him so many times. He was very patient with them. He sent them prophets and more prophets and more prophets. And they all had the same message. They said, look, repent, turn from your sins, turn from your idolatry or things aren't going to go well prophet after prophet, but they never listened. They continued worshiping other gods. Even though they were saved so powerfully in the Exodus and so many other ways, they still worshiped other gods. They continued to sacrifice their own children to the demon gods. They continued in their various sexual perversions and just general degenerate behavior. They didn't listen to God. God warned them. They didn't listen. And so he sent them judgment in the form of Babylon to destroy Jerusalem. They even destroyed the temple. And then they carried the people away, away from the land of everything they knew. But God still loved his people, right? So he, he, he judged them because they refused to accept him. But he still loved them, and even though they were hard-headed and stiff-necked. He didn't make a full end to them. And so over time, God's blessings returned to his people, and, he rem and the people remembered him as well. Ezra the scribe in his book, he, he records that suddenly this pagan king of Persia, this guy, this guy worshipped a god called Zoroaster. I don't know if you ever heard of Zoroaster, but that's not Jesus. He was a complete idolater. And then just one day, he just gets it on his heart. You know, let's rebuild the temple. The real temple, the one to Yahweh. What is that? Can you imagine that? Ezra records that the Lord just puts it on his heart and they get to work and he, he gives them back all the stuff they stole from them and the various items and artifacts from the temple and they, he sends them money and he sends them protection and they go rebuild the temple. And Ezra, you know, he, was, he knew the Bible and so he taught the people how to do it and they you know, overcame various, you know, opposition. I think some of, uh, some of uh, King Cyrus's servants one day woke up and they're like, why are we doing this again? 
Like, they shouldn't be allowed to rebuild this temple. We worship Zoroaster here. So they opposed them in various things. But they overcame and they, they rebuilt the temple. And Nehemiah was active there too. Nehemiah was a layman. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't in charge of religion. He was a regular man. And he loved God and he loved his countrymen. So he takes up the task of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem so that they can protect themselves from invaders. He takes up the task of establishing justice and leading the people. He ends up becoming their governor. Nehemiah is a great guy. He's my kind of guy. He's like a, let me give an example of what I mean. Ezra and Nehemiah are very different. There's one point in their books where it comes to find out that a lot of the Israelites are intermarrying with some of these pagan women, like the kind of women that would, you know, kill their own children and sacrifice them to, to, to Baal. And so Ezra finds out, out about this, and he's, he's shocked. I mean, he's, he's in horror. And what it says he does, because he's so horrified, is he tears his clothes, and he pulls out his own hair. And this is, I love this part. It says, he sat appalled for hours. He just sat there appalled until nighttime. So that was Ezra's kind of priestly religious reaction. Nehemiah's reaction, I don't know if you guys know what his reaction was, a little different. He hears the same news. He, he, he hears their intermarrying. He hears that the, even their children, they don't even speak Hebrew. And he confronts them right away. And he calls curses on them. And then, yeah, there's some hair pulling, but it's not his own. He pulls their hair out. He beats them. He makes them swear an oath to not continue doing this. And the best part about this is he's not like ashamed that he did this. He's like, God, remember me for my zeal for doing this. So they have slightly different reactions. I've heard one person say that Ezra, when he was sitting appalled, he had these prayers to God for something to happen. You know, God, do something about this. They're, they're marrying these, these, these people that worship demons. And the answer to their prayer is Nehemiah. So anyway, let's, uh, let's get to the passage. It's been a little bit. So the book of Nehemiah, it opens up, and, and Nehemiah is, finds out that, that Israel is in a state of disrepair. It's dilapidated, and he's there with the king because he's like one of the king's main servants. And the king sees that he's all you know, upset and, and, and sad. He goes, well, what's going on? And I've never seen you sad before. And he tells him, you know, that Jerusalem's a disaster. And so he sends him to Jerusalem with, with, uh, with a blessing to go build the wall. So he does that. He goes to to, to build the wall, but people are opposing him. People, you know, try to attack him and fight him over this, but they overcome. And, and um, he, at one point, uh, there's even a plot against him, like a secret plot to, to get the king to not like him anymore. They, they claim that he's doing some kind of insurrection or something, and, but he, he knows it's happening. He, he, he overcomes that. There's one point in the story as well where even the Israelites are still kind of doing injustice, like the leaders of the Israelites. They're stealing money from the poor Israelites, and he has to deal with that. But over time, they, they finally do it. They finally build this wall. And so they build the wall, so the wall's good, the temple's there, and all the people come together, and they're like, okay, we're going to read from the Bible. We're going to remember what, we, you know, what we're supposed to be doing here, what God has done for us. We're going to remember all this. So they do it. And here's where our passage begins. It says this. They gather together. These are the words of God. All the people gathered together at the square in front of the water gate. And they asked the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had given to them. On the first day of the seventh month, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could hear it with understanding. And while he was facing the square in front of the water gate, he read it out from daybreak until noon, before the men and the women and all who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. The scribe Ezra stood on a high wooden platform made for the purpose. Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Manasseh stood beside him on his right, and to his left were Padiah, Mishael, Malchijah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Ezra opened the book in full view of all the people, since he was elevated above everybody else. As he opened it, all the people stood up. Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and with their hands uplifted, all the people said, Amen, Amen. And they knelt low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. 
Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbathiah, Hodiah, Messiah, Kelita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah, who were the Levites, they explained the law to the people as they stood in their places. They read out of the book of the law, translating and giving the meaning so that people could understand what was read. Nehemiah the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people, said to all of them, The day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, because all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go, eat the fat, drink what is sweet, and send portions to those who have nothing prepared, since today is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, since today is holy. Don't grieve. Then all the people began to eat and drink and send portions and have a great celebration, because they had understood the words that were explained to them. These are the words of God. This is really awesome stuff, in my opinion. I, I, I hopefully, hopefully I can give you some of the excitement here, because this is epic stuff. In 2023, we need to hear this, because Nehemiah, in this story, had so many opportunities to take black pills. But he didn't. This guy was a powerhouse. If I, if I have another son, I'll name him Nehemiah, maybe. Middle name, we'll see. Not that Nehemiah's a bad name, it's a good name. But he just refused. He didn't take any, he, he, no despair at all. He refused to do it. Jerusalem had been sacked, destroyed. The people were captured. He was living as a foreigner in the land where people worshiped Zoroaster, whoever that was. Black pill was offered to him there. Black pill refused. He finds out through the grapevine that Jerusalem is just dilapidated. Everything's breaking. The walls are broken. Black pill offered. Black pill refused. He eventually gets this miraculous permission to go rebuild the city. It's, it's just so weird to me. Like this, these pagans are just like, you, oh, you want to rebuild this fortress that we destroyed? Go ahead. Makes no sense. But he did it. But then some of the locals, they don't want it built. So they're trying to stop him. And they you know, come up with plans. That's a black pill right there offered. Totally refuses. He keeps going. He starts work on the wall. But then the opposition that had been planning for a long time, it starts to attack. And so his men, they literally, it's what it says in the Bible, they have to build the wall with their tools in one hand and fixing the wall and then the sword in the other hand because that's how often they're attacking. There's a black pill offered, totally refused. Then he finds out that he's, <laughs> this is just like, this is, adds insult to injury. Like he finds out that he's been putting all this work into building this wall for Jerusalem. You know, we're going to serve God again. This is going to be great. And somebody tells him, oh yeah, you know, your buddies, the leadership of, of Israel, yeah, they're like stealing from the poor people. He's <laughs> like, I can't imagine. It's just like another problem. Like, what does he have to do? Black pill offered, but he refuses. Yeah, I told you about this plot. They, they, after this, they, they plot against him. They're like, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to say to the king, they're like, yeah, we, we saw them practicing their insurrection. There, there's violence happening here. We're going to tell the king that. But Nehemiah sees it coming, and he just keeps going. So everything's done. Like, he gets through all of this, all these black pills just, you know, being handed out like, like candy. I don't know. It's handy candy. Candy's not really handed out. I don't really know where that expression comes from, handed out like candy. Anyway, he gets through all this, and, and the work is done. They've built the wall, so he, he gathers the people, right? This is their moment that everything's finished, and they're going to serve God again, so we're going to hear from God, and... And this is going to be awesome. This is going to be a big white pill. But they read it, and the people start weeping. And there's, they're despairing, and it's just like a heavy kind of situation. And, and that's not what Nehemiah intended. He wanted this to be a joyous moment, but it wasn't joyous. And I think that the reason people were weeping is because they realized just how they're God's people, and they know that, but they haven't been acting like it for a very long time. And they hear this law of all these things that God has told them and how to act and what not to do. And, and they recognize that they're not even close to measuring up to this. They were deeply sinful. They had backslidden so far that they didn't even recognize this law anymore. And they wept because they didn't even know what to do about it or where to begin. This is just like 
a despair moment for them. And so they're weeping and crying, and I think this is like the, the final black pill that Nehemiah is being offered here. What's he going to do? Nehemiah, though, he was a zealot, man. He was very zealous. He was a, like, a, in, a, in a good way, he was a maniac. Because all he was, he had this zeal for the Lord. That's all he was concerned with. So he was not even tempted to take this black pill. And he sees the people weeping, and basically what he tells him is like, nope, we're not doing that. Not today. You hear people say, not today, Satan. That's what I think Nehemiah was saying here. He's like, no, no this is a good day. Today's a holy day. You don't, we're not going to weep today. This is a celebration. So he tells him, this is, this is my favorite part. He says, get the, get the best meats, the, cho the choice meats, you know, with the fatty parts, the parts that taste like they're just so good when you barbecue them just right. Get some of that. As a matter of fact, get a whole bunch of that. Get the choicest meats and get, make sure you get enough for the poor and we're all going to eat. And go, by the way, get some drinks too. Get some sweet drinks. Get the best wine. Make sure you get some for the poor because we're going to all eat, we're all going to drink, and we're going to remember that the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. What that means is that joy is not just something that like, you scrape by to hopefully one day get it. Like you got to struggle and scrape by and maybe one day you'll get joy. No. God is strong. If the joy of the Lord is his strength, that's something we can have now. We must have joy now. In 2023, we must have joy. Pastor Doug Wilson put it this way. He said, many Christians spend a lot of time fighting for their joy when they ought to consider fighting with it. Joy is not the treasure behind us that we are fighting for. It's the tr sword in our hand that we are fighting with. The joy of the Lord is a weapon. It was a weapon for Nehemiah. That's how he used it. He saw the people were in imminent danger of blackpilling. That's my paraphrase. And he said, you know what? We're going to have a feast. We're going to have a celebration. We're going to throw a party. Enjoying God's good gifts, even the simple gifts of food and drink. He said, that is what we're going to do. Because despite your previous disobedience, you are commanded today, and this is for all of us, today, no matter what the circumstances are, you're commanded today to have joy and enjoy yourself. Wallowing in your sin. This is something I'm tempted to do, right? When I've sinned, this is what they were doing. They wallow in it. As if somehow, if you're like really sad, you know, you look really sad, you feel, you act really sad, like that earns you some points with God. Like, he, he knows that you really are sorry if you're sad about it. That doesn't do any good. God's not fooled by that. In some cases, I would argue that that whole act of despair, that actually compounds your sin. Taking the black pill, I mean, straight up, if you're it, it, despair, that's a sin against God. That's why I chose this passage that, that was read earlier to you, that from one from Deuteronomy. I... I I bet you some people, many people, probably didn't know that that command was in the Bible. Because Deuteronomy, you think about Deuteronomy, you think, oh man, that's that huge list of do's and don'ts. And it sounds dry, and there's prohibitions, all the commands, it's, it's, it's hard to read through it. But then right there in the middle, like right, right in the middle of the book, he says, we're going to have a feast. You know, it's, 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 not, it's, it's not every year, there's a certain sabbatical year, you're going to take a tenth of everything, your, all your grain, your meat, your wine, you're going to take all that, and he even makes a stipulation, he says, look, if that's too much to carry, here's what you do, you sell it, turn it into money, and then when you get to the place that I'm going to show you, you buy, this is what he says to buy, ready? Spend the silver on anything you want, cattle, sheep, goats, wine, beer, or anything you desire. Anything you desire. That's what he says in the book of Deuteronomy where it's supposed to be a list of all these prohibitions. He says, you're going to feast there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice with your family. Anything you desire. You see, people like to make it sound. They, 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 they do documentaries about this. They'll, they'll do uh, movies about this. In the shows, it's like this. It's like God is holding back. right? He's holding all these good things back. That's not 
how God is presented in the scriptures. God's not kidding. This is a command. You are commanded to joy. Enjoy yourself with your family because joy itself is a weapon that God intends his people to use. It's a weapon against Satan and, and, and the demons. The gates of hell cannot stand against joy. I know this is an Old Testament law, and, you know, not people don't want to read Deuteronomy. I get it. But surely we can find a way to apply Deuteronomy 14 where it says you're going to rejoice with your family. Surely we can find some application to today. Eat the fat, drink the sweet. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Man, do we need to remember this today in 2023. I'll, I'll be honest, especially in June of 2023, this month, there's black pill pushers everywhere right now. On every street corner. You know, I can't even watch a baseball game with my kids without sexual perversion being pushed on them. I just can't do it. Every game, the commercials are, they're, they're perverted. That's a black pill being offered right there. June, June is full of black pills. Easy to just take it in despair and say, oh, man, I can't play baseball, can't watch baseball. The whole world takes the entire month of June to push LGBT plus pride. Ever wonder what the plus means? I don't think anyone wants to know. They push that, and the message is very clear. Christians, your religion is backwards, it is bigoted, and you are homophobic. This month, literally every major sports team tells you that. Every, almost every major company. So many stores fly this flag. They even stole the covenant symbol of God, the rainbow. All of that is to demoralize you. It's all to demoralize you. And it essentially wants you to be beaten into submission to admit, you know what, God got that one wrong. Sodomy's good, actually. That's what they want. That's a black pill being pushed. You just have to refuse. You just can't take the bait. You can't take the black pill, especially this month. June, ironically, is a great month for a feast. Gather with your friends, meet with your family, get some money together, buy a good you know, piece of fatty meat, get some good wine, some beer, maybe not Bud Light. It's kind of, it's kind of gross anyway. <laughs> <laughs> get together and throw a party the joy of the Lord is your strength look if you're going to be reviled for an entire month because you actually believe crazy things like boys have boy parts and girls have girl parts then okay just be reviled smile have a party and have great joy for the whole month God actually commands this. Here's what he says. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. When you're called homophobic, what you should be doing, I heard this from Doug Wilson too, when you get around the corner, you know, maybe you don't want them to see you or maybe they do should see you. You should dance a little jig the next time you're called homophobic. That's what it says here. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Eat the fat, drink the sweet. The joy of the Lord is our strength. What happens if your business is protested because you refuse to fly the flag? The Bible says, count it a joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. By the way, these aren't trials that like, it's your fault, like you did the wrong thing and then you faced a trial. That's not the kind you should rejoice. It's the kind when you do the right thing and you still face trials. Eat the fat, drink the sweet, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Maybe throw a barbecue that day. What about if you're blocked for a promotion at work because you refuse to sign the paper that says homosexuality is the greatest thing since sliced bread? These things actually happen if you work for a larger corporation. Here's what you should do. Eat the fat, drink the sweet, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Maybe throw a dinner party. Maybe a church picnic. Maybe invite your boss, the one who blocked you from the promotion. Maybe even invite HR. If you want to get real daring, maybe not invite HR. <laughs> I'm in HR, so I can say that. What if you get fired, though? 
get fired because you didn't use the right pronoun. You did it intentionally too, you knew, but you didn't use the right pronoun with a coworker. That's tough. That's a black pill being offered there. You got fired. Here's what you do. You eat the fat, you drink the sweet, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Maybe we could organize a time of singing of psalms and hymns in the town green. Maybe afterwards you can throw one of those awesome Baptist potlucks. I know we're not Presbyterians here, so no beer at the potluck, but that's okay. The joy of the Lord is our strength. This applies to so much more than just Pride Month, or whatever they call it. This applies to so much more. This is for all of life, for all your circumstances. No matter what is happening, eat the fat, drink the sweet. The joy of the Lord is our strength. This joy like that drives the demonic realm insane. They hate joy, but especially the kind of joy that you have when they think you should be overdosing on black pills. They're like, man, like, he just got fired. Like, his his whole career, it's gone. Why is he having a picnic? That's what I imagine the demon saying. I remember, I remember this, this idea of joy as a weapon. I didn't really know about it at the time, but there was a time a couple years ago, and um, this was like right when I first started getting involved in like what people call the culture war in a public way. I had a friend that, you know, he, he since disowned me, but at the time he, he was still speaking to me, and, and, you know, he was mad because I was speaking against the woke stuff and the social justice stuff that we've all been forced to endure and we're still enduring to many degrees. And I remember when, at one point he was like confronting me in an email. He refused to talk to me, but he emailed me. And he said, you know, you know, Adam, it's not so much what you say. It's not so much your beliefs, but it's how you're acting. He's like, you're, you're, you're laughing. Like you're, you're, you're making jokes about this. Here we've got this, this conflict, this serious conflict. And it's like, almost like you're enjoying it. He said that I should be grieving. That's what he said. He said, why don't I ever see tears? That's what he told me. Of course, it wasn't true. Of course, you know, in my life, in times of, of grief, grief is legitimate. I cry. I shed tears. It wasn't true, but he's like, you should just be grieving. You shouldn't be laughing and enjoying the fight. I thought very carefully about what he said when he said that. And... I came to the conclusion that he was 100% right. I was enjoying it. Because it's good to be on the Lord's side. I'm not going to pretend it's not. It's an unfair advantage to be on the Lord's side. And I'm loving it. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And i got to be honest, when I thought about that long enough, it became very clear that he didn't want me to have joy because he knew it was a weapon. He knew and it was working. Because people can see someone giving a message to them and be all sour face and it's not attractive. Nobody wants to do that. They're always angry. But when you're enjoying life and people are shouting at you, I've been lied about many times. Even in, even in like, you know, national articles, people have lied, vicious lies, things that if you know, you guys heard, you wouldn't know it's not true, of course, but if a random person heard, they would think I'm the worst person in the world. And I, you know what I did when I saw that? I made a video about it and I was laughing about it. There was a, I, I, man, I can't believe I'm referencing Doug Wilson three times. But anyway, gotta look around, like, that's not a good thing. Doug Wilson was, was lied about once uh, early in his ministry and his wife showed him the paper where they wrote this lie. And, and uh, she's like, look, look, look at this. Like, they just made this up about you. And instead of, like, fighting back and saying, I, I, I can't believe you said this, they, they talked about it. And <laughs> this is really funny. They, they had his wife send a, a letter to the editor, and uh, it was responding to this. And the response was, man, you guys don't know the half of it. <laughs> He's worse than that. <laughs> you got to laugh about this stuff sometimes. But the, the point is, even if you're not going to laugh, you can't allow yourself to despair. You cannot take the black pill. 
the media tries to get you to take the black pill so in so many ways. Don't take it. Don't take it. You got to be like that. I don't know if you've seen uh, Shawshank Redemption, but there's Shawshank Redemption is like a prison movie. And at one point, like the main character, the prisoner, he breaks it or he's in the, the warden's office and he decides that he's going to play this beautiful music on the loudspeaker. And he knows that he's going to go to the hole for months for this. And he does it. And the, the, just like the beauty of that, of that song, like he was joyful. He hadn't actually done what he was committed, uh, um, convicted of. So he was in this pit of like despair. I can't think of a more despairing place than prison. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to play the song for everybody to hear. Because this is the kind of thing that he does. He was, he was full of hope. He was white-pilled to the max. He was doing what he could to eat the fat and drink the sweet. You know, he couldn't get the choicest meats. He couldn't get the best drinks, but he could do this. And so he was not going to allow his circumstances to drive him to despair. That's some good stuff. Don't allow yourself for a moment to think that it, it's, it's greater is he who is in the world than he who is with us and in us. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength, and we ought to always act like it. Eat the fat, drink the sweet. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord God, I pray that these people would be full of your joy. I pray that they would enjoy their lives, remembering that life is, is a vapor. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. And that you've blessed us in so many ways, Lord. These people are your people. And even that fact, that single fact, is a blessing beyond measure. Because if we're honest with ourselves, there's nothing really in us that, that, that would make it make sense that, you are, that we were your people. We don't deserve your mercy. We don't deserve your grace. And yet, you've given it to us, God. And that fact in and of itself is something that should drive us to never, ever take the black pill and to have joy in our lives. Help us, Lord, to remember the poor. I, I, I did not touch on that here, but that's part of this, Lord, that, that that joy can be shared with the poor. Those people are your people too, God. So I just pray, God, that, that in this month and in all months, Lord, that, that we, would, we would find uh, joy, that we would use joy, that we would, that we would love our lives, that we would love our, 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 our brothers and sisters, our family, our friends, that we would treat them the way that we would want to be treated, God. And through all of it, God, we are just immensely grateful for your mercy and your gifts. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.